Hello, welcome to session 10 of uh, Arbitration Bootcamp. Uh, this session is called 10 Mistakes Made in Arbitration, and I was I thought I could do it in one session. It looks like I can uh, do it only in two sessions. So my next session will be the, the, final, uh, the final 10. Um, I still have a lot of ideas about, uh, about arbitration bootcamp topics. So even though this was going to be originally my last session, I was planning on doing 10, uh, I am going to continue into the next year. And if there's any topics that you haven't heard about that you'd be interested in hearing about, uh, let me know. The purpose of these talks is essentially to take conceptual topics that we all hear about and put them into a practice perspective. And what I do is talk about how you use these concepts in everyday practice, provide you with some resources that I talk about later on that, that you can actually use in, in your own practice, whether you're counsel or an arbitrator. Um, this session is going to be in the same format as the other. So I'll talk for about 45 minutes. I'll leave the last 15 minutes open for questions. I've got my Q&A box open. So if you think of anything while I'm talking, I'll do my best to answer it at the time. Otherwise, I, I'll deal with it at the end of the session. If you haven't heard about me, uh, and this is the first session you're joining, welcome. I am a partner at Learners, an arbitrator at Arbitration Place, and uh, also a, a an editor uh, of the arbitrationmatters.com blog, where you can see recent decisions on arbitration matters released by the courts, as well as some commentary. And the, the decisions are posted regularly on the website, but you can also subscribe for free and you'll receive uh, about six new cases, summaries of new cases about a month. So feel free to go on to the blog, www.arbitrationmatters.com, if that's of interest to you. So today I'm going to get through the first three of 10 common mistakes. I thought I would get through five when I was planning this session, but it turns out the first, the first three are actually quite, um, quite, quite uh, detailed and juicy topics, I think. And so what I'm going to cover today is the seat of the arbitration. There's lots of confusion about what that concept means differences between appeals and set-aside applications, and the differences between awards and orders. So that means my next session in October will be, does it matter whether the domestic and arbitration and domestic and international uh, legislation applies? The answer, of course, is yes, but, but I'll answer why. Inherent jurisdiction versus the arbitrator's power to maintain the integrity of the arbitration, and that's significant because it also means that there's probably wider uh, scope for, uh, for jurisdiction of the arbitrator than many uh, generally assume. Admissibility versus jurisdiction, a very common issue that, that uh, trips counsel and arbitrators up. The dangers of some shortcuts to save time and money in arbitrations. Failing to participate, fail failure to object or waiver of rights uh, under arbitration. And, and one of the things that I think is the most interesting, because few people think about it, as counsel creating an arbitrator disqualification situation. And I'll describe those circumstances in which it can arise, and they're actually surprisingly frequent. And counsel not taking uh, advantage of the benefits of arbitration. So that's coming up in the next session. In this section, I'm going to be delving into uh, some of these issues quite in a quite detailed way, and, and I'm going to be relying upon the Ontario legislation to do that uh, because it's the one that I'm most familiar with and also because uh, I can hopefully answer any questions you have about it. But but I'll, I'll say at the outset that, that as you consider the concepts that I'm discussing, it's absolutely essential that you look at the relevant legislation um, as it applies to your arbitration because there are some very subtle differences uh, in wording, and sometimes those subtle differences can be meaningful in your case. So the first topic is the seat of the arbitration, and, and it's the most difficult concept, I think, for counsel who are transitioning from commercial litigation practice into an arbitration practice. And, and even if you do some arbitration, you may not appreciate the significance of it if you're doing mostly domestic work where the, the uh, seat of the arbitration is Ontario and the law of the contract is Ontario. In fact, you may get, a, uh, get along quite nicely without even understanding the importance of of the seat and it may not be significant at all to you, but it is absolutely essential in international arbitration. Uh, 
And it's a concept that does befuddle people, sometimes even courts. So it's a great foundational topic for really understanding arbitration. So, so what is it? It's sometimes called the place of the arbitration, and that in itself can create confusion. And what that really means, it means is it's the legal place of the arbitration, and it's, it results in a choice of law that the parties make, usually in their arbitration agreement when they choose the seat. It's the place that's legally connected to the arbitration and determines ultimately what courts have uh, supervisory or supportive jurisdiction. And so, for example, that the seat determines where the parties will go if they like to appeal the award or set it aside, where they need to have the court's assistance to either appoint an arbitrator or have an arbitrator removed, for example. So if the seat of the, of the, the arbitration, for example, is Ontario and it's a domestic arbitration, then the Ontario Domestic Arbitration Act will be the, the act that applies when the Ontario court has supervision over the, the arbitration. If the seat is in Ontario, but there is, uh, it's an international arbitration, then the Ontario Commercial International Arbitration Act applies, and that, of course, adopts a lot of law. So we're essentially talking about uh, the model law as the relevant legislation. So strictly speaking, because we're talking about the, the courts and the legislation that have jurisdiction, it's not technically correct to talk about a seat being in Toronto or Vancouver or Calgary. Um, to, really correctly, it's it's it, the, the the seat should be the on you know Ontario, BC, or Alberta, but but the 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 potential confusion, of course, is that the use of the word seat could refer to the party's preference about where the 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 hearing will take place, and that really is the biggest confusion that people have about what the seat means. They sometimes assume that the seat is the place where all of the hearings must take place, and that's not the case, and I'll talk about that in a moment, but if the arbitration agreement says that the arbitration is to take place in Ontario, Calgary, Manitoba, that makes the, the applicable legislation a lot clearer. And so the, the seat determines what, we, what you hear called the Lex Arbitrary. And that may be different from the substantive law that applies. So you may find a contract that is to be interpreted in accordance with the law of Alberta, and yet the seat of the arbitration is Ontario. And there are even more complexities in international arbitration, but it's very important to make sure that you understand those distinctions. So it may be that there is more than one law that's applicable, even to a domestic arbitration situation. And as I said, the seat is to be distinguished from the place of the hearings of the arbitration. So the hearings will often take place in a location that is convenient to counsel or to the witnesses that may not in fact even take place in the same location. So you may have some witnesses who give evidence in one location and the rest of the hearing takes place in another. And there may be very good reasons why uh, the parties would like to have the location of the hearing in a very different place than the seat. So for example, it may be uh, of importance to have proximity to an international airport or some very sophisticated uh, hearing facilities. Or for example, the seat of the arbitration is a very difficult place for parties to enter into because of complex visa or difficult visa requirements. Um, and that won't necessarily, uh, that doesn't prevent the, the hearings from taking place in another jurisdiction, even though the seat is the one in which entry is difficult. Or to give an example that's very uh, current today, if, for example, the people chose, the parties chose a seat to take place in Ukraine and didn't want to actually enter Ukraine because of the war, they could still conduct their arbitration with seat in Ukraine and having the hearings take place somewhere else. So hopefully that such that the difference is 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 becoming more clear. How does the seat get determined? Well, it gets determined by the parties. They have a choice of seat. And if it doesn't get decided by the parties, usually in the arbitration agreement, it gets decided by the arbitrator who usually chooses a seat which it has the closest connection to the parties in the dispute. So why is the seat actually important? So because the seat determines the supervising courts, it's very important that the parties choose a seat which has courts that are knowledgeable about arbitration and supportive of arbitration. 
We call that an arbitration friendly jurisdiction. And it may be that the parties want, for example, to choose a seat in which the model law is the relevant jurisdiction because parties are familiar with it. There's a well-developed uh, legal structure and that can be a very important consideration in an international arbitration. Or the parties may choose a seat, neutral seat that has no connection whatsoever to the dispute and that sometimes is done so that neither party feels that it's, it's subject to an unfair advantage because, for example, there's some identity between the location, the seat, and one of the parties. It's common to see as seats New York, Paris, London, Singapore. And so you'll see I've got a combination there of cities and, and countries. And, and so notwithstanding my comment that it's much better to identify the, the legislation, um, the governing uh, body of the, that, that has issued the legislation or enacted the legislation, you'll see that that's not common practice, but which can lead to some confusion, which is another reason distinguishing in your mind between the seat and the location of the hearings is absolutely critical. Another reason why the seat is so important is most parties will want to ensure that the seat is a place where the New York Convention has applied, uh, it has been enacted, and that is many say is the most um, successful international treaty because so many uh, countries have have enacted it and are signatories to it. But what it means is that if the seat is a place where uh, in, in, where um, where the Newark Convention has been enacted, it really does make enforcement of the arbitral award uh, much easier. And enforcement is something that many parties, many parties in council misunderstand. And, and to enforce uh, an award in one of the Newark Convention states really is all about making sure that the procedural fairness uh, uh, was present in the underlying proceeding. It's not really an opportunity if somebody is opposing enforcement to claim, for example, that the arbitral award is incorrect at law. So really, if there's an enforcement initiative in a New York Convention state, the focus on the state that is, is being asked to recognize or enforce the award is on the procedural fairness. The, the, the grounds for failure to enforce are procedural grounds. For example, the party to the arbitration agreement was under an incapacity. The arbitration agreement is invalid. The party was not given proper notice of the appointment of the arbitrator or was unable to present its case. The award deals with a matter outside the arbitration agreement. The composition of the arbitral tribunal was not in accordance with the party's agreement or was not in accordance with the law of the seat. The award is not yet binding. For example, the, the period of time uh, when the, the appeal uh, may be brought or a set-aside application has not yet expired, and so there's still a possibility that the, the final award will will in some way be challenged. And, and the reason it is important then for the seat to be a Newark Convention um, state is so that the, the there is certainty about the kinds of uh, matters that will be relevant on an enforcement proceed, proceeding and and the parties who sign on to to uh, to to a state in which the New York Convention applies understand that the limitations in in having the the infor award enforced relate strictly to procedural grounds. The, another reason why the choice of seat is important is that the, the seat must be identified in the award or it will not be enforceable. So for example, um, Article 31 of the model law requires that an award in order to be enforceable refers to the seat. And, and there are similar requirements, for example, in the Ontario Arbitration, uh, Ontario Arbitration Act. So reference to the seat is absolutely essential in the award. The award should also be reasoned, provide the date of the award and, the, and have the arbitrator's signature, of course. And to add to the confusion, the place uh, of the uh, where the award was signed, which is not necessarily the seat or place of the arbitration. So those are formal requirements under the relevant legislation with respect to an award. And one of those requirements is identifying the seat. So as I've said, the concept of seat can be very confusing, particularly to people who are not arbitration practitioners. And one of the most recent cases that I can think of in which that became an issue was, of course, the Uber and Heller case 
And just to refresh your memory, this was a case in which there was a motion brought by the defendant, Uber, to stay the plaintiff, Heller's court action on the part on the, the basis that the party's arbitration agreement required um, Heller to arbitrate in the the, um, the Netherlands. Heller argued that the arbitration agreement was unconscionable and invalid in part because of the requirement to arbitrate in the Netherlands. Under the Ontario Act, which was relevant to the decision, courts must grant a stay unless it determines that the arbitration agreement is an in invalid. And here, the Supreme Court of Canada found that the arbitration agreement was unconscionable and invalid and therefore denied Uber's request for a stay. The arbitration agreement required that the plaintiff pay upfront and administrative filing costs in order to initiate the arbitration of $14,500 plus legal costs, which the court determined was, was uh, a significant portion of Mr. Heller's remuneration as uh, an Uber driver. And the, the court also said that Mr. Heller would get the impression by looking at the arbitration agreement that he was required to go to the Netherlands to proceed with his arbitration because the arbitration agreement provided that the place of the arbitration was the Netherlands and a lay person would not necessarily understand that the place was a legal term and not a, a, and not a a, a, a term of art and not just a, a word that could be that would be interpreted in the ordinary course. And so that was one of the factors that the Supreme Court relied upon to say that the the clause was unconscionable. And it noticed that it, it did note, of course, that the, the idea of the legal place or the seat is different from the place as one ordinarily considers it, but that from Mr. Heller's perspective and from the perspective of other the other potential members of the plaintiff class, that would not be apparent. So th that takes us through the seat of the arbitration issue. Next is the differences between appeals and set-asides. So the appeal and set-aside application are two avenues for challenging a final award. And of course, an appeal is available only under the domestic arbitration, not under domestic legislation, not under the um, international, uh, international uh, legislation. But there, there are very different remedies. So an appeal provide is, is, is something that can be granted where the arbitrator has made an error on the merits. A set-aside application can be, can be a, a granted where there was some procedural irregularity that made the process unfair. In many cases, you'll see that parties will seek both forms of, the, of relief and, in one case, bootstrap one of the the claims against the other, but they really are distinctive. Um, they really are distinctive remedies. And there is a recent case, which I think is consistent with previous cases, that a party cannot opt out of the model law, even if it will, even if desired, if the parties desire desire it. And that's EDE Capital Inc. versus Guan, 2023 Ontario Supreme Court. 2373. And the reason that concept is important is parties can't choose um, to opt in or out of the applicable legislation. And, and as an extension, they can't opt out of uh, a set aside application by choosing the um, in, in their arbitration agreement uh, to do so, because that's a fundamental right, a fairness right that parties have. And you'll see in the Ontario Arbitration Act where there is provision for opting out of certain of the sections of the Arbitration Act, but setting aside is not one of the provisions that parties may opt out of. Now, to talk specifically about set-aside applications, essentially the grounds for set-aside are procedural unfairness. And the foundation for those rights is in the fundamental of part, right of parties to be treated fairly and equally. And you'll see that language in both the model law and in the domestic legislation, except BC, which talks about uh, the parties being treated fairly alone. So, for example, under the Ontario Arbitration Act, under Section 19, in an arbitration, the parties shall be treated equally and fairly 
and each party shall be given an opportunity to present a case and to respond to the other side's cases. And this is a concept we also see in Article 18 of the Model Law. A set aside in Section 46 of the Ontario Domestic Arbitration Act provides that on an application to set aside, the court may set aside award on any of the following grounds. A party entered into the arbitration agreement while under legal capacity. The arbitration agreement is invalid or ceased to exist. The award deals with a dispute that the arbitration agreement does not cover or contains a decision on a matter that's beyond the scope of the arbitration agreement. The composition of the arbitral tribunal was not in accordance with the arbitration agreement or if the arbitration agreement did not deal with that matter was not in accordance with the act. The subject matter of the dispute was not capable of being the subject of arbitration under Ontario law. The application was not treated, the, the applicant was not treated equally and fairly, was not given an opportunity to present a case or to respond to the other party's case, or was not given proper notice of the arbitration or of the appointment of an arbitrator. The procedures followed in the Arbitration Act in the arbitration did not comply with the act. The arbitrator has committed a corrupt or fraudulent act, or there is a reasonable apprehension of bias, or the award was obtained by fraud. So if you recall the list of factors that I set out earlier in this session about the, the grounds upon which enforcement of an award may be resisted, you'll see a parallel. And essentially these grounds refer to some denial of a party's procedural rights as opposed to an appeal in which there is some challenge to the actual merits of the award, the rightness or the wrongness of the legal conclusion, the rightness or the wrongness of the conclusions as to facts. There is different language under the model law, slightly different, uh, Article 34, and it is very clear. An application for setting aside is the exclusive recourse against an arbitral award. In other words, there is no appeal under the model law, and the factors that are listed in Article 34 of the model law are very similar to those that I just listed under the Ontario uh, legislation. There, there are procedural grounds for setting aside the award. So some wonder why an appeal is available under the domestic legislation and why it's not available under the um, the the model law. Now, I, I should say uh, that in Quebec, there is no appeal either. And, and it's, it's our legislation applies to both domestic and international arbitrations. And it's very uh, much influenced by the model law. So, so in interna the international context, uh, the policy for not allowing an appeal essentially is that there should be min minimal intrusion by courts of the seat where the parties come from different legal fora. In other words, they have deliberately, um, in an international context, chosen a seat, but that doesn't mean that they're buying into all of the legal consequences of that. And, and there may be uh, suggestions of, of um, favor, uh, some, some more favorable seats than others, for more favorable legislation in certain seats than others. Um, they deliberately chose a process that did not involve the courts instead of, except in very, very limited circumstances. And the threshold that the courts really consider in determining whether there has been a, a, a violation of a party's right for fairness and equality is that the parties are entitled to a fair process but not a perfect process. And so when you, you review the cases, you see this in the decisions of the courts in which they say that this was not a perfect process, but this particular violation was minor or didn't affect the outcome or words to that effect. So there are examples of circumstances in which a set aside will likely succeed. The arbitrator made a decision based on a theory or evidence which the parties did not have a chance to address. So, for example, um, the parties didn't have an opportunity to present or respond to the other side's case. That falls within uh, the party's rights. The arbitrator did not allow the parties to cross-examine witnesses after the, after the arbitrator asked questions. The award deals with matters that are beyond the arbitration agreement or does not cover matters within the arbitration agreement. 
or the arbitrator did not follow the process agreed upon by the parties, either in the arbitration agreement or the rules the parties chose. As I've said earlier, parties cannot contract out of this fairness right, which is the right to seek to set aside an award to, that does not offer these basic procedural fairness uh, requirements. But parties can always agree that they will not be afforded the right to appeal, even in jurisdictions in which an appeal is possible. So parties can agree that the only recourse they may have is to set aside in circumstances of unfairness. And why would they do that? There may be reasons that the parties would like an, a very speedy resolution. And so they don't want an opportunity for this, this to have to go to the courts, uh, possibly for multiple levels of appeal. Maybe they value certainty uh, over the possibility that the arbitrator may make a legal or factual error. And maybe one of the reasons for that is they have an ongoing economic relationship and they need to have this, this dispute behind them in order to carry on with the rest of their relationship. So appeals. What do appeals look like in, in Canada? Um, the, the legislation uh, is, is different across Canada. There are some similarities, of course, but there are options that the legislation gives parties. They can, they can have a right to appeal on a question of law with or without leave um, and or on a question of fact or mixed fact and law. So, for example, under the uh, under Section 45 of the Ontario Act, the if the arbitration does not deal with questions of law, a party may appeal an award to the court on a question of law with leave. So that's if the parties have not granted themselves the right to appeal on a question of law and a court shall grant leave only if it is satisfied that the importance to the parties of the matters at stake in the arbitration justifies an appeal and the determination of the question of law at issue will significantly affect the rights of the parties. If the arbitration agreement, however, provides that a party may appeal an award to the court on a question of law, no leave is required. And for example, in Ontario, these leave decisions get made by the, the Ontario Superior Court of Justice in BC, for example, um, appeals go straight to the BC Court of Appeal, and that's under the new uh, 2020 BC uh, Court of Appeal, uh, BC Arbitration Act. So, so I'm just identifying a few slight differences in legislation across the country to emphasize the importance of actually going to the specific relevant le legislation of the seat to understand rights. And this includes not only during the course of the arbitration and following the award, but while drafting the arbitration clause, if you're in a position to do that. So in Ontario, under Section 45 sub 3, if an arbitration agreement so provides, a party may appeal an award to the court on a question of fact or a question of mixed fact and law. So if the arbitration agreement is absolutely silent, then an appeal may be brought only on a question of law with leave of the court. But you'll see that in, in under, under this legislation, the parties may provide for alter, alternate routes of, of appeal. And this is where the, the SATFA case comes in, which, which is cited in virtually every uh, appeal of a commercial arbitration award, because it was the case that established absolutely that contract interpretation is an exercise of mixed fact and law. And this is obviously critical to most commercial arbitration awards because they involve contract interpretations. And this means that only according to SAFA, in the rare case, will a matter uh, of that relates to the issues decided by the arbitrator be an extricable error of law as opposed to a question of mixed fact and law. So if the arbitrator has made, the argument is, an error interpreting the contract, then in ordinary circumstances, that will be a question of mixed fact and law, and unless the parties have provided, will not be subject to an appeal. And only subject to appeal, where there's an extricable error of law, where, the, where, um, where there's an, in a, an application of an incorrect principle, a failure to consider a required element of a test, or failure to consider a relevant factor. And you'll see if you're closely watching the case law that many, many 
parties try to fit themselves within this extricable error of law concept, and it is very difficult to do and rarely uh, supported by the courts. And part of this is because the Supreme Court of Canada was very clear that it's rare that you will find an extricable error of law. Sometimes, however, there will be a procedural issue that's an error of law so that both an appeal and a set aside will, uh, uh, application may be brought, but these are really distinct um, re remedies. Now, to add to the potential confusion here, there's a line of cases uh, out, of the Brit uh, out of the British Columbia courts that, that say that a misapprehension of the evidence going to the core of the outcome can be an error of law. So an error of fact can be an error of law for the purposes of a right to appeal where that error of fact goes to the core of the outcome. You following me? And this was a decision called Escape 101 Ventures versus March of Dimes Canada, 222 BC Court of Appeal 294. Leave was recently refused by the Supreme Court of Canada and I, I will send you that citation. But it's really important because this has opened the, the possibility of potential appeals in BC under this uh, this case, um, and there are there is a line of cases in BC that that follows this uh, this case. In Ontario, however, there's a very different line of cases that is developed, and one of the most um, the most widely read example of that is called Tall Ships Development against Brockville City, 2022 Ontario Court of Appeal, 861. And it talks about the caution that is necessary in order to extricate a question of law. And the reason for the Supreme Court of Canada's decision in SAFA to limit the, the circumstances in which an appeal may be brought of, a, of a, a, a commercial arbitration award is that during the contractual interpretation uh, exercise, the mixed fact and law exercise is is one that should be within the jurisdiction of the tribunal and to rule otherwise really introduces in, in efficiencies into the arbitration process that it was designed to avoid. And so there's a bit of a dueling uh, perspective on what the rights of appeal are in, in Ontario and BC right now. And the fact that the Supreme Court of Canada denied leave in the March of Dimes case raises a really interesting question about where this this case law is going to go. And if you're interested in this, there's a there's an article in the Canadian Journal of Com Commercial Arbitration, which again I'll send to you by link called Arbitration Appeals on Questions of Law in Canada. Stop extricating the inextricable. So I'll send you that. Very much worth a read if you're tr struggling to understand these differences. And I have to say, I'm, I'm one of the co-authors on it, which is why I recommend it highly. But it does set out the cases uh, and the facts and the, and the law in, in, in a lot of detail. So I, I think you'll find the analysis interesting, even if you don't necessarily agree with it. So the third topic is the award versus the order confusion. And on its face, it doesn't sound like it should be confusing, but the difficulty is that the legislation doesn't necessarily consistently refer to awards and orders in a way that makes them understandable. And so the, the, the moral is you really have to understand what the, the order or award is doing rather than the label that may be given to it by either the legislation or by the arbitrator. So you see in the legislation the terms award, order, decision, ruling. And that creates a lot of confusion. And I've seen a lot of that in the courts, not defined. And so let's let's talk about some fundamental concepts in arbitration law that I hope will will help elucidate the significance of those those words. And hopefully um, under underline the importance of using the correct terminology so that a court will later understand it if there's any re recourse to courts. So first, an award. An award is a final determination of one or more substantive issues between the parties. So it's a merits determination. And there need not be a single award. So many people are, are familiar with, with involvement in arbitration in which there may be a number of procedural orders, but the end of the, the arbitration culminates in a final award, which deals with all of the issues raised by the parties. Not all arbitrations proceed that way, which is why it's important to understand what an award is. 
And I've, as, as I've said before, an award must meet the formal requirements set out in the legislation in order to be enforceable. So signed by the arbitrator, dated, the place that the, 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 that the uh, award was signed. Um, necessary for an award, but not, for example, for a procedural order. The, the Ontario Act talks about the, the tribunal being permitted to make more than one final award and disposing of more than one matter. The award must also contain reasons, which is not necessarily the case in other forms of, I'll say them orders, but, but although it may be good practice, so a procedural order may not contain reasons, but some ruling, uh, it may be helpful to, to, to provide reasons. And the model law says specifically at Article 31, reasons must be provided unless the parties agree. And that's also the case in, in uh, the Ontario legislation. And I'll talk next session about why parties might not, not might agree that reasons are not necessary. Although one, one example in the legislation is if the parties have reached a settlement agreement and they'd like a settlement award, uh, that's enforceable by the courts. It, it, it's just like a, a an award um, uh, that the parties may take out after a settlement in court proceedings. The 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 issue of reasons is one that that I, I think I'll address in a future session because what are adequate or insufficient reasons and that is another matter of debate. So while the legislation will require requires reasons and presumably there must be sufficient reasons so they're not challenged. There's debate about what sufficient reasons really means. So back to kinds of awards. There is a preliminary award, which is which can be something like the preliminary ruling made by a court where there's a, a, a question or challenge to arbitration and that's to, to the jurisdiction of the arbitrator. And that's found in, for example, section 17 or article 16. So if a party makes a preliminary objection to the jurisdiction of the arbitrator, the arbitrator may decide it at that time and then that will be decided in a preliminary award, or the tribunal may decide to deal with that issue in the merits, and then it will be dealt with in a final award. But because it's award, um, it, it raises an issue of how does it get enforced, and the, the Section 17 uh, provision, for example, provides that the the decision or ruling of the arbitrator may go to the neck to the first level of court, the Ontario Superior of Justice, which is required to decide the matter. So there's a ruling made by the arbitrator, which then goes to the Superior Court of Justice who decides the matter. And again, understanding the difference between rulings and orders and, and awards can assist in understanding that uh, that process, even though the language in the um, in the legislation is unclear. So I've now, I've got a question. Requirements applicable to a, an award is where a seat of arbitration again becomes significant. Some jurisdictions, for example, Sweden require wet, wet ink signature on award for it to be enforceable. That's a really good point. Does the law in the seat of the jurisdiction allow, for example, electronic signatures. And I think this question points out that there, there are some places in which the parties much act, must actually put uh, pen to paper in order to, uh, to, to uh, sorry, the arbitrators to, to actually have an award which isn't enforceable. That's, that's a very good point. Again, going back to the legislation in the seat. Partial award. So I've talked about what a preliminary award is. A partial award deals with some issues, substantive issues, but not others. So for example, if the, the proceeding is bifurcated and you have a liability portion of the arbitration and you have a damages portion of the arbitration, you may have a final award that deals with liability, um, a, a final award that deals with damages, and each of them may well be called a partial award, but because they deal with a substantial um, issue, they could be called a final award, a final partial award. And again, this is where the terminology gets really loosey-goosey, but as long as you understand the concept, you will correctly identify the award. And if you make a mistake, it can create um, confusion. So I've got another question. You talked about appeals versus set-aside applications. Can you discuss set-aside applications 
versus enforcement proceedings. Set aside applications must be, must be brought in the place of arbitration. Enforcement takes place in the jurisdiction where the enforcement is sought. Absolutely. Can set aside issues be dealt with in the context of enforcement proceedings? Must enforcement await the outcome of the set aside proceeding at the seat? So I'll, I'll answer the first question. Can set aside issues be dealt with in the context of enforcement proceedings? The answer is no. Set aside proceedings must take place at the seat of the arbitration. And you're quite right that enforcement proceedings generally will take place in a jurisdiction in which the losing party has assets. So the, the real correlation between the set aside application in the seat of the jurisdiction and the potential enforcement proceedings in the play in the, the place where the um, the losing party has assets is that the criteria are very similar because the real issue is was the award fair was the process fair if it wasn't in at the seat of the jurisdiction the award may be set aside or at the place of the request for enforcement it may not be enforced. Must enforcement await the outcome of a set aside proceeding at the seat? Yes. And you'll 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 recall that in my list of matters that may prohibit enforcement is the criterion that the the award be final in the sense that there is no outstanding appeal or set aside or the time for those proceedings having to be brought has, has already expired. In other words, the award is final. So there's no risk that at the enforcement uh, place, there will be uh, an award set aside that, the, that that jurisdiction has already recognized and enforced. So I've reviewed a preliminary award a partial award and an interim award. And I'm almost at my 45 minute mark. I'm gonna go, I think a little, uh, almost to noon if, if I can, because I'm addressing the, qu the questions as they come in. I kind of don't wanna stop in the middle of this, this issue because I think it's, it's essential. There's also an interim award. And the Ontario legislation says at section 41 that an arbitrator may make one or more interim awards. Well, what is an interim award if it's a final determination on the merits? And I think this is a very confusing um, issue because, because I think of what it refers to as is what we, we talk about in international arbitration as interim measures. And so under the Ontario Act, under Section 18, that involves, for example, an order for pres preservation of property. And while I am reluctant to use the word injunction because it's a court term, the concept is what we're really talking about. There may be an interim award made to preserve property or rights before a final award is rendered. And that's what the legislation is really talking about. So maybe, for example, under the uh, under an international award, it may be an, an international arbitration. It may be better to refer to the to the ruling as a an interim measure order or something of that nature. But now I'm adding a complexity that I think is probably unnecessary. As long as you appreciate that the label is not determinative of the effect that the order or award has. Consent award. So under the model law, uh, Article 32. Um, the the that is a, a settlement consent award need not have reasons and that makes sense because as I said it may it probably reflects a settlement and because the the award is on consent and determines the substantive right of the parties therefore it's it's an award then we get to final award and we've already heard that there's more possibly more than one final award it may be a final award that actually doesn't dispose of everything, in which case it might be a partial award, but a really effective way of, deter of, of talking about a final award that doesn't uh, resolve all issues, for example, costs, is for the award to internally reserve the jurisdiction of the arbitrator to deal with the issue of costs, and once the substantive issues have all been resolved, to call it a final award except as to costs, for example. And again, there's a there's a cost award. Now, there's also something called an additional or supplementary or correcting award. And that is something that may be issued once the parties have received the award. And within 30 days, if they have any questions about the award, they can ask the arbitrator to correct or amend the award to deal with those things. So, for example, the Ontario Act provides that under Section 44, that where there are arrow, errors, typos, math errors, etc., or injustices caused by an oversight 
the arbitrator upon the request of the parties or uh, upon the arbitrator's own motion, as it were, to deal with a claim presented in arbitration but omitted from the award. So this is essentially some kind of a mistake or a math error. The, the arbitrator, before becoming functus officio, has an opportunity to fix those problems. And interestingly enough, the, the courts do not seem to require that a party seek this correction or amendment before challenging the award, usually by way of an appeal. Under the model law, however, essentially the, the, the parties can request the arbitrator to both correct computational errors or typos or clerical issues, but also to interpret a part of the award. We don't see that language in the Ontario legislation. And here's another good example why a careful reading of the legislation is absolutely essential because the, the rights that arise may very well be different. A party under the model law may also ask the arbitrator to make an additional award with respect to claims presented in and omitted from the award. Then finally, we have an order or a direction and we're familiar with an order in the form of a procedural order, number one, two, three, whatever. And it cannot be reviewed by a court on appeal, but may be subject to a set-aside application on the basis that there's been some unfairness in the process. So the, the issue about awards and orders is something I think is really well exemplified in a case called Russian Federation Against Luxtoma, Luxtoma. Luxtona, 223, 2023, Ontario Court of Appeal, 393. And it's worth reading on a whole bunch of, uh, on, on for a whole bunch of issues and all of the various court levels, because it essentially holds that the, the court's ruling on the, um, whether on the preliminary um, jurisdiction uh, objection, which goes to the Ontario Superior Court to decide the matter. The Ontario Superior Court's rule is to consider the issue afresh. So it's a de novo application. And so the words decide the matter refer not to an appeal, but a hearing de novo. And that's extremely important. But, but to the issue that I'm talking about today, the our arbitrator who made this initial this ruling on the initial jurisdiction question actually did not call the decision an order or a ruling but called it an award and so there's there's an outstanding question in that case about whether that actually affects the route to appeal and so if you go back to my to my uh, comment about the, the label is less important than what the the um, actual function of the decision is, uh, that issue in this context has not been decided. And there's a decision called United Mexican Estates against Burr, in which the court has has recognized that as an outstanding issue, which the court called riding both horses, but hasn't uh, actually fully decided the issue. So that's the end of um, this session. As you know, I made it through my top three of my top 10. My next session on October 12th uh, at the same time at 12 p.m. will cover why does it matter whether the Domestic or International Arbitration Act applies, the inherent jurisdiction of ar an arbitrator as opposed to the power to control the process, admissibility versus jurisdiction, the dangers of some shortcuts to save time and money, failing to participate in the arbitration or object or waiver of rights, counsel creating a disqualification, disqualification risk. In other words, there's conduct on the part of counsel, which may result in the arbitrator being disqualified and counsel not taking advantage of the benefits of arbitration. As usual, at the end of this session, you will get both a recording and uh, a uh, list of the resources that I've talked about with links to them. And if you want to know more about the analysis that I give to some of those cases and some of the other writers who work with me on arbitration matters, you can go to arbitrationmatters.com where you, where you see a summary of a lot of these cases and some commentary. So I don't see any further questions. If anybody's got a question, now is your time to ask it. So I'll just wait a few moments to see if somebody's going to add a question. and I don't see anything popping up. So have a great day, and I look forward to seeing you on October 12th for the second part of uh, Common Mistakes, 10 Common Mistakes in Arbitration.
Have a great day. Bye.